so the human brain can be sexualized by many different forces which act in parallel or at different times of the human life. So these differentially sexualized brain it can cause differential behavior, but also differential susceptibility to some pathological conditions. So there are very clear sex-based differences appear in the prevalence of some neuropsychiatric disorder. And uh, autism spectrum disorder or ASD is very prominent in having a very strong male bias. So for every female uh, diagnosed with ASD, we have four males with the same diagnosis. Male and female brains differ in their total brain volume, uh, gray matter volume and white matter volume. And as you can see in these um, not stereotypically colored whatsoever graphs, uh, these sex-based brain differences, differences are not a dimorphism, but they are a continuum. So there is a significant overlap between the sexes. Although these differences are most pronounced uh, in adults, at least some of them appear during embryonic development, as male neonates have a slightly larger brain volume than females. So another indication of the embryonic origins of these differences are the gene expression patterns. So this is a number of differentially expressed genes during fetal, postnatal development and adulthood. And it is very obvious that the highest number of differentially expressed genes appears during the fetal development in the neocortex, which is a part of the brain that we are actually interested in. So in addition to the obvious reason to these sex-based uh, brain differences, the chromosomal complement, XX or XY, sex, sex hormones play a crucial role in masculinizing the brain. So in this graph, you can see the amounts of testosterone in the blood plasma of a male. And in addition to a well-known uh, testosterone surge during puberty, there is another surge prenatally when the embryonic testes actually start producing testosterone and it is almost at the same levels as during puberty. And it is this testosterone surge that masculinizes the brain and the rest of the body. So we wanted to understand the developmental origins of at least some of these brain differences. And we tested the effects of sex hormones <coughs> sorry, and the chromosomal complements, so XX, XX or XY, on human embryonic neurogenesis. So we had a relatively simple strategy. We generated brain organoids from a male and female cell line and exposed them to different sex hormones, androgens, testosterone, and DHT, which is dehydrotestosterone and estrogen. So normally testosterone can be aromatized into estrogen and exert its function like this, uh, but DHT cannot. We assessed the hormones effects on cell biology of progenitors, their proliferation and neuron production, on their mechanism, receptors and signaling. I will not talk about this today, but you can ask me later. And we were interested in any potential differential gene expression that might occur. <clears throat> so this is the timeline of our experiments. We start adding hormones at 17 days after organoid generation. And this time point was chosen because at this stage, the organoids roughly correspond to the stage when in the embryo the testosterone surge starts. So before I show you any of the results, I have to show you what our brain organoids look like under the microscope. So this is one of our brain organoids, four brain organoids chopped in half. And each one of these little cavities is a ventricle, which is very similar to an embryonic brain ventricle. When we have a look at the epithelium surrounding each ventricle, we see that it um, resembles an embryonic epithelium. So these purple cells are called radial glia, and they give rise, as they divide, to basal progenitors, so these guys here, uh, intermediate progenitors in yellow, and basal radial glia in white. Basal progenitors produce uh, neurons, and these neurons migrate up, and they will settle themselves in the cortical plate, which will become gray matter of the brain. So when we have a look at what uh, sex hormones do to our brain organoids, the most obvious phenotype was an increase in the number of intermediate progenitors, which you can see here marked with TB2. So these are these yellow cells here. And in the quantifications here, you can see the numbers of intermediate progenitors at both 35 days and 52 days in both male and female cell lines. <clears throat> They're increased under the influence of both DHT in yellow and testosterone in green. So we measured several of the other parameters and it is always uh, androgens that gave a very similar response. What is very, very uh, important is that, that there was no difference in response to uh, androgens between male and female cell lines. So in addition to uh, an increase in intermediate progenitors, application of DHT also increased the number of basal radioglia, which are these white cells here, as seen here by quantification of PUFX, which is a marker of these cells. And when we have a look at the pro pro proliferation of these progenitors, it is also increased, as shown here by the double staining the TBR2 and prolifer pro proliferation marker KS67. So uh, what is also very interesting and important, estrogen did not elicit any phenotype in any of the assays that we studied. So just to summarize, application of androgens, THT and testosterone, 
causes an increase in the base of progenitors in the developing neuroepithelium, and these progenitors cycle more. And we were, of course, interested in what is the mechanism of this increase. So in order to study this, we did a clonal analysis and we injected GSP labeled Sendai virus into the ventricle of the organoid. So this label individual radioglia, so these purple cells here, and then we exposed organoids to DHT for eight days. And this is what a clone looks like after eight days. So these are individual clones. So after eight days, we could observe that in organoids treated with DHT, here in yellow, the size of the GSP clone is, uh, was bigger. So we then labeled a novel population of radioglia, this time by RFB expressing lentivirus, and then removed DHT from the media. After another eight days, so the size of the RFP clone was the same between DHT and control organoids. So this shows us that uh, DHT increases the pool of radial glia by promoting symmetric division, increasing the clone size. And what is also very interesting in this process is transient and de dependence on DHT. If you remove DHT, uh, radial glia don't uh, proliferate in a symmetric manner anymore. So in order to understand the transcriptional differences that lead to this androgen-induced phenotype, uh, I did an RNA-seq uh, at 35 days. And we uh, were interested in differentially expressed genes between control and androgen. So among the control, uh, sorry, among the genes upregulated in androgens here on this side were two HDACs or histone deacetylators. And in order to look at transcriptomic changes from a bit of a different angle, we performed single cell RNA at the same stage for 35 days. So we, we detected several subpopulations of radial glia. And one of them, RG1, radioglia 1, here in red, was significantly increased in organoids treated with DHT. What was very important and special about this population of radioglia was that it has, an, sorry, it has an elevated expression of ribosomal biogenesis gene. So these are just some of them. Uh, and ribosomal biogenesis could be indicative of an increased mTOR signaling. And indeed, when we have a look at uh, members of the mTOR signaling pathway, even though they're lowly expressed, they are increased in the DHT-treated organoids. So what is very interesting that both of these candidate um, gene sets or gene pathways uh, are implicated in autism spectrum disorder and schizophrenia. And previous work has shown that they can exert some of their function through androgen signaling. So they were really good candidates for functional testing. So we wanted to separately test these two candidate genes or two sets of candidate genes. And so we did this with specific inhibitors. So the application of different types of HDAC inhibitors, so like really specific ones that uh, inhibit only HDAC 2 or 2 or 3 or HDAC 1 and 3, or very general ones like valproic acid, but I'm not showing that data, significantly reduced the number of intermediate progenitors as compared to the control. And this reduction was rescued by co-treatment with DHT. So HDAC inhibitor and DHT rescued this phenotype. Similarly, similarly, in inhibition of mTOR with uh, SAP anesthetic, which I'll just call SAP for short, uh, also greatly reduced the number of intermediate progenitors in our organoids. And this phenotype was also rescued with the application of DHT. And you can see this here in the Compenag images where TBR2 is in white. You can see that it's almost gone in the SAP treatment. So what I will show you until now was done all done in brain organoids of the dorsal telencephalon. So this is this upper part of the brain. What is very interesting about our brain is that there are two main types of neurons and um, they're produced in different parts of the brain. So excitatory neurons here in green are produced in the dorsal part of the brain, while um, inhibitory neurons are produced in the ventral part of the brain. And they have to migrate like this radially and establish themselves here in the neuronal layer. So we were interested in what would happen in that part of the brain and we generated ventral brain organoids and exposed them to sex hormones. So DLX here in yellow is a microventral intermediate progenitor. Since this in the ventral part, there is no TBR2. In ventral organoids, the application of DHT did not cause an increase in, in the number of intermediate progenitors. And if you remember, in dorsal, in dorsal organoids, uh, the, this population was increased. Again, application of estrogen uh, didn't, uh, did not elicit a phenotype. So what, I have, well, what I've been talking to you about all this time, sorry, H9 is a female line. Uh, was dealing with neuroprogenitors and their proliferation, but of course we are interested in what's happening to neurons. In the end, sex-based brain differences are probably neuronal numbers. So when we had to look at neuronal numbers by a pan-neuronal marker N2 and D2, neuro D2, after our normal <clears throat> already established protocol, we see that at 52 days there is actually no difference between control and DHT, uh, in, uh, DHT treated organoids, even though the numbers of progenitors are increased. So we were a bit confused by that. 
and we hypothesized that this is maybe due to um, the cells, the increased numbers of progenitors still cycling, and therefore we would have to wait much longer to see a potential increase. But 52 days is already quite long, so we devised uh, a similar, <clears throat> we devised a, a pulse chase experiment in which we shortened this exposure to hor uh, hormones. So we start again at 70 days, and we stop at 35 days, and then grow organoids without hormones until day 52. And in this setup, we indeed observed a significant increase in the number of neurons at day 52 in DHT treated organoids. So basically, what we think is happening is that through an increase in basal progenitors, DHT causes an increase in neuronal numbers. And this last piece of data uh, takes me to our working model. <clears throat> so we have an embryo which has its radial glia in the neuroepithelium. And radial glia uh, express this uh, androgen receptor in a cyclical manner, but I, <coughs> sorry, I, was, uh, I didn't show you that today. And uh, in, without androgens, uh, a radial glia would uh, divide asymmetrically and produce one basal progenitor and one radial glia. And after a time, these basal progenitors will produce a certain number of neurons. If androgens are present, like in a male embryo, <coughs> the shift is balance of division to a more symmetric one. And then one radial glia can produce two radial glia. So this increased progenitor pool can give, later, uh, can give rise to a larger number of basal progenitors, and a larger number of basal progenitors will give rise to a larger number of neurons. And this might be, uh, in the background, obviously, some of the morphological sex-based uh, uh, differences that we observe straight after birth. So um, this increase in excitatory neurons is observable in the dorsal cell encephalon. But the progenitors in the ventral cell encephalon do not respond to androgens in the same way, and potentially the number of interneurons remains the same. So in the brain, uh, the numbers of excitatory and interneurons are normally at a certain ratio, <clears throat> so there's more excitatory neurons. But the shift in this production under the influence of androgens could lead to a greater imbalance of excitatory to uh, inhibitory neurons, which is actually really important because it, this is, it is this skewed balance that is a uh, characteristic of some of the disorders that have a sex um, uh, bias, like uh, autism spectrum disorder and schizophrenia. So with this, I would just like to thank everybody in the Madeline's, in Madeline's lab, especially Madeline, of course, everybody else. I'd like microscopy, bioinformatics, and Alex, who did some of the bioinformatics analysis for me. And thank you very much for your attention, and I hope to get some questions from you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eva. That was brilliant. Huh? A question from uh, Amin. C can you try to mutate uh, the androgen receptors in your organoid and observe uh, possible effects? Yes, yeah, so we actually did two mutations of androgen receptor. We did a constitutive reactive one, and it shows when you have a like, constant uh, activation of androgen signaling, those cells are locked in a proliferation state, and they're kind of in an unhealthy proliferation state. I also did a, a dominant negative mutation of androgen receptor, and unfortunately, cells don't really like that because they die. So obviously, they do need a certain level of androgen receptor in order to maintain their uh, proliferation status. Okay. Um, a question, I think you already answered. You, did you, do you use uh, embryonic stem cells or iPS cell line? So you mentioned uh, an ES cell line, right? I didn't mention, but we use the embryonic stem cell lines. Yeah. And uh, which method do you use to inject uh, the lantivirus into the organoids? Uh, manual. We just inject with a very, very fine capillary under a microscope. So it's just very fiddly. So a question from uh, Vicky Metzis. How do you think androgen treatment specifically alters the basal progenitors? Are they the only ones to express the, the receptors? Well, actually, it is. Uh, uh, we think what we uh, I have the I have the data on um, in situ on in situ hybridization of androgen receptor, and it is the radial glia that express the androgen receptor in this that initial pool of progenitors that is in, increased, and therefore, therefore their daughters are also increased. Yes, we do see some uh, increase in proliferation of basal progenitors. So it might be that a specific subpopulation of basal progenitors also expresses the androgen receptor and is able to respond to those um, signals. But that, I can't give you those details simply. <clears throat> it is difficult to, within C2 uh, hybridization to exactly quantify and pinpoint which is the subpopulation. And maybe a last question from, from myself. You, you mentioned oscillation or, or variation in level of androgen receptors, which is important to 
unlock the proliferation of progenitors uh, and all of them to different. Can you say a little more? Do, do you know what is the cause of these variation? Uh, so we don't really know what the cause is, but we observe that straight after division, there is a less energy receptor, and then as, as daughter cells uh, separate, they start expressing energy receptor at that point and become obviously responsive. So we are not really sure what is happening there, but we have just observed that they're different. And, and if you have a look at um, in situ hybridization, you can see a slight difference in, in um, this distribution of mRNA dots in the whole of EZ. Yeah, but uh, we are not exactly sure what is in the background of this regulation.